Hi everyone, I'm Bert Wagner and today I want to talk about slow SQL queries, uh, in particular about jobs that maybe feel like they take forever to run, or they, they do actually take forever to run. Uh, maybe you end up killing them before they finish. Um, at least I know that's what I used to do way back when, when I started learning SQL. Um, and I had different you know, analysis jobs or transformation jobs. I was trying to get my data uh, transformed and looking the way I wanted it to, and I would do it really poorly. Um, essentially, I wasn't using SQL Server the way it was supposed to be used, and because of that, my jobs were just super slow um, to the point where I would leave for the night and come back the next day, and they really haven't made any progress. And it's not that I was doing anything complex or difficult, it was just my uh, lack of knowledge of what, how I should be doing this. So today I want to share some tips that I always use to make my jobs run fast. So here's an example of a typical job I would have that would run real slowly. Right? Let's say I query my SQL server and I get some data. And I take that data and I load it into my programming layer. Right? So that could be something like uh, Excel or SAS or R. Python.net, right? Something that I'm going to manipulate my data with. Run my SQL query, get my data, load it into my programming layer. Then maybe I do some filtering, I do some transformations, and maybe some aggregations, some summaries, you know, summarize the data. Um, and then I get my kind of one data set all done. Then I go back to my SQL server, write another query. Of course, I'm using just select star from users or whatever. Um, so it's bringing back everything. I'm bringing that data back into my programming layer and I'm filtering that out, I'm doing more transformation, so on and so forth, and then finally, I need to merge my two data sets together, so I'm not doing that in SQL, I'm doing that in my program. Um, you know, it's slow, it's inefficient, uh, then maybe I do some more transformations, yada, 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 you know, repeat, repeat those steps over and over until I finally get the result I want. So that's an example of how my jobs looked like. Um, you know, when I started writing SQL, I never realized that they were inefficient due to my lack of knowledge of how I should be building these jobs. So today I want to go over some techniques that I always use to make sure I'm not losing efficiency in really basic ways, right? So these tips are things that I do to all of my SQL jobs regardless of what they're doing because they help boost performance. They're not going to solve all your performance problems, but at the very least this should be a starting step. So first thing, common thing I always used to do is I used to write select star. Um, you know, when you're just developing a new query or something, select star is really great. It's nice and easy to get all the data you need. However, it is very likely it is killing your performance. Um, you know, let's say you have a table with 20 columns on it and you only need five or six of them. You shouldn't be bringing back all those extra columns with select star, right? That's extra data that's being transferred over the network and is slowing everything down. It's also extra data that's needing to be read from disk which slows things down and because you're using select star most likely your indexes on your SQL server are not getting used. Um, so just all, all around really slow performance if you're using select star for, uh, for querying your data. If you need to get all the columns in a table, let's say you have a pretty narrow table, you know, 10, 15 columns and you do need them all, it's still a bad idea to use select star because select star is going to bring everything back and you're just really adding technical debt to your processes. What I mean by that is today your job might work with select star, but two years down the road when a column gets added to that table, you're going to have maintenance work to do because suddenly your programs, your downstream processes that were expecting 15 columns now get 16 and unless you accounted for that, which most people don't, myself included, everything's going to break. Um, so just, it's a bad habit, get out of it. Anything that you, you know, run regularly, run into production, get rid of that select star. It's just going to hurt performance. Second thing I want to talk about is joining your data on the SQL server. So in my example of my super slow job, I brought my data into my program, then did my transformations, and then brought in another set of data from a separate query, did transformations, and then I joined all my toge data together. That's a really bad idea because SQL Server is really good at joining data together. Um, and not only that, is if you join your data together on the server, especially if you're using something like an inner join, that data is going to get reduced down in size, meaning you know, less rows that are coming back, um, and therefore that'll be less data you have to transfer over the network. So it's much better to join that data up front on the SQL Server and then send less data over to your program. Next up, 
where clauses, right? So not only are we not doing select stars, not only are we joining our data on the SQL server, but we should try to filter down the data as much as possible, right? This is the reoccurring theme here. The less data that you send across the network that you have to read from disk and everything like that, it's the faster your jobs are gonna run. So let's say you know you have a table of data with a million rows, but you're only interested in the past month worth of transactions. Maybe that's you know 30,000 rows. Filter on that. Filter on that because that's going to be 970,000 less rows that you got to transfer over the network, which will greatly reduce your speed. So if you're not filtering in where clauses on your SQL Server, start doing that. Another way to improve performance is by using the built-in SQL functions to help reduce your data even further. So for example, right, we have aggregate functions in SQL, which take a lot of data, lots of rows of data, and you know, consolidate them down to fewer rows, like sum or count. You know, if you have 10,000 rows that you want to sum up, maybe to get the total, you know, order revenue for the month, instead of bringing those 10,000 rows over to, you know, .NET or Python or whatever, and doing the summations there, just do it in SQL Server so you only have to send over that one value, that one sum of data. So all the SQL aggregate functions, right, are great for doing that for collapsing your data basically for summarizing your data so there's less data that you have to eventually transfer. And the great thing with aggregate functions are that you can also use the over clause in SQL. So you're not just limited to an entire data set of data that you want to summarize or perform some aggregation to. You can actually use you know, the over clause to do some windowing on your data set to break it up into smaller sets to get even more flexibility. So Really, any kind of you know min, max, summations um, that you need to be doing, you could take care of it on the SQL Server. Additionally, SQL has scalar functions, which also help with reducing the amount of data you're sending over to your programming layer. Um, so things like is null and coalesce functions and case statements, right? You could take a table that has multiple columns, and maybe you're wanting to combine those columns together with some kind of logic. You can use those scalar functions to reduce the number of columns you need to send over. You know, the less columns you have to send over, the less data is getting read from, read from disk, the less data that's getting sent over the network. Um, so definitely use those functions to your advantage. Finally, if you're dealing with any kind of XML or JSON data, right, let's say you are in your programming layer, you're generating some JSON or XML for some other output process further down the road, um, you might want to consider generating that data in SQL Server. Now, SQL Server is not the best at generating strings, which XML and JSON data are, uh, but in certain instances, especially if you're doing a lot of transformations or filtering of your data first, it might be faster to actually transform and generate your JSON or XML strings on the SQL Server before sending it to your application. I actually had a blog post from a few months ago that compared the performance of SQL Server's JSON functions to Newtonsoft's JSONs.net's uh, .NET library, and it turned out that SQL Server is actually faster in certain scenarios at generating JSON data. So if you're able to, you know, test that out. And that's the thing with any of these changes. Test your changes out before, obviously, implementing them in production to see where you do get speed benefits and where you don't. So that's it. Hopefully you can use all of these tips to improve your jobs and they won't feel like they're running forever. Um, let me know how you do. If you have any questions or comments, please share them below. I appreciate getting feedback. Definitely makes my day. And uh, happy querying.